Hello and welcome to week five. This week we're going to start talking about second order and higher order linear ordinary differential equations. And we'll cover the first three sections of this chapter. In this chapter we're going to be looking at differential equations like these. Y double prime plus some function P of T Y prime plus some function Q of T Y is equal to G of T. P, Q and G could be any functions because the Y terms are separated by plus signs. It's one Y, some T's but one Y, some T's but one Y, some T's. This is a linear second order equation. Or we might choose to have a function in front of the y double prime term. So we might be looking at things like capital P y double prime plus capital Q y prime plus capital R y is equal to capital G. Again, this is a linear second order ordinary differential equation. If g, small g or big g is always zero, then the differential equation is called homogeneous. If we have a function which is not always zero, then the equation is non-homogeneous. To understand this, we can think about what if the function y is always equal to zero? Do we end up with zero equal to zero, or do we end up with a function equal to zero? If y is equal to zero, we can cross off this, we cross off this, we cross off this, we just get the zero on the right. So if g is also zero, we end up with zero equal to zero. If we have zero equal to zero, then we have a homogeneous equation. If instead we have, let's say zero on the left, but the function g was not always zero, just pick an easy function, let's say cos t. If we ended up with something like zero is equal to cos t, this is not true for all t, so this equation is non-homogeneous. To start with, we're going to talk about homogeneous equations with constant coefficients. So, so we're going to be looking at the easier second order linear ordinary differential equation. A y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to zero for numbers a, b and c. First example, solve y double prime minus y is equal to zero. We want to find a sum function y that when we differentiate it two times, we still have the same function that we started with. What functions do we know that when we differentiate them, we still have the same function? We know e to the power t. If we differentiate e to the power t, we still have e to the power t. Differentiate the second time, we still have e to the power t. E to the power t satisfies this differential equation. What other, what other functions might satisfy this? What about e to the power minus t? Differentiate this one time, we get minus e to the power minus t. Differentiate it a second time, we have plus e to the power minus t. If we differentiate this function two times, we have the function that we started with. So yes. This function also satisfies the differential equation. What about if we took a linear combination of e to the power t and e to the power minus t? Differentiate this two times. Do we have the function that we started with? And the answer is yes. In fact, this is the general solution to this equation. Every solution to this equation can be written in of the form c1 e to the power t plus c2 e to the power minus t for some constant c1 and c2. An initial value problem. Solve y double prime minus y is equal to zero. y of zero is two. y prime of zero is equal to minus one. The first thing I want to note is this initial value problem has a second order differential equation and it has two initial additions. 
These are always the same. A third order equation should have three initial conditions, a fourth order equation should have four initial conditions, and so on. We know that C1 e to the power t plus C2 e to the power minus t satisfies the differential equation. Here's another number two. Second order equation, two initial conditions, and two constants in the general solution. Again, this is a rule. We're looking to find the solution which passes through the point 0, 2, because y of 0 is 2. And we want the slope at this point to be minus 1, because we're told in the problem that y prime of 0 is equal to minus 1. So we need to choose the constant c1 and c2, which satisfy these two initial conditions. Using the first initial condition, using y of 0 is equal to 2, we can calculate that c1 plus c2 must be equal to 2. Then we go on to the second initial condition. We need to differentiate our function. y prime is c1 e to the power t minus c2 e to the power minus t. And then we test the second initial condition. And we find that we must have that c1 minus c2 is equal to minus 1. We have two equations, two linear equations for C1 and C2. You know how to solve these from linear algebra. So we, we know how to find C1 and C2. You can check that we must have C1 and is a half and C2 is 3 over 2. So as we know C1 and C2, we can write down the solution to the initial value problem. The solution is a half e to the power t plus 3 over 2 e to the power minus t. Now let's go back to the general first order homogeneous linear second order ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients. In other words, this equation. In the previous example, We've solved this problem using exponential functions. So the question we should ask ourselves is, do we always want exponential solutions? Oh, it might be. Let's make that guess. The guess that the solution is e to the power of rt. Maybe this is the solution to equation 1 for some number r that we don't know yet. Let's test our guess to see if our guess works. We can differentiate two times, and then we can put these into the differential equation. And we find that we must have a r squared plus b r plus c multiplied by e to the power r t is always equal to zero. Now, e to the power r t is always not equal to zero. The graph either looks like this, or it looks like this, depending on if r is positive or negative. Always e to the power rt is not zero. So for this equation to be true, this first term must be zero. So we must have that ar squared plus br plus c is equal to zero. We know how to solve this quadratic equation. Equation two is called the characteristic equation of equation one. And using the theory which we, calc which we showed on the previous page, e to the power rt solves the differential equation if and only if the number r solves the quadratic equation, the characteristic equation. The, the characteristic equation has two roots, which we'll call r1 and r2. There's three possibilities for this. 
we might have two different real numbers. We might have complex numbers, complex conjugates, or we might have real numbers, but the same real number repeated. We're going to need to study these three cases separately. First, we're going to study case number one. We're going to suppose that our two roots are real numbers and they're different numbers. In other words, we're going to be looking at equations where b squared minus 4ac is strictly greater than zero. Then we know two solutions, e to the r1t, e to the r2t. These are both solutions to the differential equation. And therefore, every linear combination of these two solutions must also be a solution. In fact, this is the general solution to equation one. So let's do an example. Solve y double prime plus 5y prime plus 6y is equal to zero. First, we need the characteristic equation. We look to see what numbers we have. We have the number one, the number five, and the number six. So the characteristic equation must be 1r squared plus 5r plus 6 is equal to 0. I'm choosing to write the 0 on the left because I want to factorise this on the right into r plus 2 and r plus 3. So straight away we know the roots are minus 2 and minus 3. As soon as we know the roots, we can write down the general solution. Some constant c1 e to the power minus 2t plus some constant c2 e to the power minus 3t. And that's it. That's the whole solution to this differential equation. Write down the characteristic equation, find the roots of the characteristic equation, and then write down the general solution. An initial value problem. One differential equation, one second order differential equation, which needs two initial conditions. We know the general solution to the differential equation. To answer this problem, we just need to find the constants C1 and C2. Because the derivative of y is minus 2, C1 e to the power minus 2t, minus 3, C2 e to the minus 3t, we can use the two initial conditions to find C1 must be 2 minus C2 and 3, this must therefore be minus 4 minus C2. And then we can find C1 and C2. And that's everything we need. Now we can write down the solution to the initial value problem. Another problem. Solve 4y double prime minus 8y prime plus 3y is equal to 0 with the initial conditions y of 0 is 2, y prime of 0 is equal to a half. First thing to do is to write down the characteristic equation. In Differential equation, the numbers are 4, minus 8, and 3. So in the characteristic equation, the numbers are also 4, minus 8, and 3. We solve this quadratic equation. This time I'm going to use the formula, minus v plus or minus the square root of v squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. And I find that the roots are 3 over 2 and 1 half. As soon as we know this, we can write down the general solution to the differential equation. <coughs> it's always constant, e to the power first root t, that's constant, e to the power second root t. And then to finish the problem, we need to use the initial conditions to calculate the constants C1 and C2. 
I leave it for you to check that the constant must, must be minus a half and 5 over 2. And that's all we need to do. As soon as we know the constant, we can write down the solution to this initial value problem. So let me summarize. To solve a second order linear homogeneous differential equation of constant coefficients, what we need to do is we need to find two linearly independent solutions. We've talked about case one. If the two roots of the characteristic equation are different real numbers, then the two solutions that we want are e to the power r1t and e to the power r2t. Case two and case three, we haven't done yet. We'll, fit, we'll fill this information in as we learn. Before I go on to talking about um, complex roots, I want to talk briefly about fundamental sets of solutions. Let's go a little bit more general. Let's suppose now we, we allow functions of t. y double prime plus pt of y prime plus qt of y is equal to zero. We're going to be looking at this equation a lot, but um, I want a short way to write this. Instead of writing the whole equation each time, I want a short way to write this. So I'm going to define the linear operator capital L to be two derivatives with respect to t plus pt, one derivative with respect to t plus qt. So what I mean is <coughs> if I write L of y, that's two derivatives of y plus pt, one derivative of y plus qt, y. Or y double prime plus pt, y prime plus qt, y. So instead of writing the equation at the top, I have a short way to write this. I can instead just write this as L of y is equal to zero. Anytime you see L of y equal to zero or L of y equal to something, it just means this differential equation, which is at the top of this slide. Let's suppose we have two solutions of L of y is equal to zero. Then this theorem says every linear combination of y1 of y2 is also a solution to this differential equation, this homogeneous linear differential equation. This is a simple proof. We know that L of y1 is equal to zero because y1 is a solution of the differential equation. And we know L of y2 is equal to zero because it's a solution of the differential equation. We just need to show that L of y is equal to zero. So we're calculating L of C1 y1 plus C2 y2. That means two derivatives of C1 y1 plus C2 y2, that's PT. One derivative of C1 y1 plus C2 y2, that's QT C1 y1 plus C2 y2. You can look at this and convince yourself that this is just the same as C1 multiplied by L of y1 plus C2 multiplied by L of y2. But L of y1 is 0, L of y2 is 0, so we just have 0 plus 0. Because L is a linear operator, that's, this is the proof that L is a linear operator, any linear combination of solutions is also a solution. We're going to need something called the Ronskian, named after a Polish mathematician whose picture I put at the top. The Ronskian of two functions is the determinant of the matrix y1, y2, y1 prime, y2 prime. If I want to specify which functions I'm using or what time it is, I might write w of y1, y2, and t. If 
I'm being lazy if I think it's obvious which functions we're doing. I might just write W. <coughs> Suppose that y1 and y2 both solve L of y is equal to zero. And suppose that the Ronskin is not zero at at least one point t. Then c1 y1 plus c2 y2 is, then this set of c1 y1 plus c1 y2 contains every solution of the differential equation. Because this contains every solution to a differential equation, this is called the general solution to this differential equation. So this is repeating the ideas from the first section. We need to find two solutions. We need them to be linearly independent so that their Ronskin is non-zero at at least one point. And then we're going to write C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2 to get the general solution. In this case, when y1 and y2 are two linearly independent solutions to the differential equation, <coughs> we say that y1 and y2 form a fundamental set of solutions to our differential equation. For example, Let's suppose y1 is a square root of t, t to the power of a half, and let's suppose that y2 is 1 divided by t to the, power, t to the power of minus 1. In this question, we're asked to show that these two functions form a fundamental set of solutions to the differential equation 2t squared, y double prime, plus 3ty prime, minus y is equal to 0. This is a homogeneous linear second order differential equation. And we're told that t is strictly positive, so we don't need to worry about taking square roots of negative numbers or dividing by zero. To answer this problem, we need to do three things. We need to show that y1 is a solution to the differential equation can't be in a fundamental set of solutions if it's not a solution. We also need to show that y2 is a solution, and we need to show that these two functions are linearly independent. To show that they're linearly independent, we need to show that their Ronskin is non-zero somewhere, for some t. So first, let's look at y1. show that y1 is a solution of this differential equation, we need to start with 2t squared y1 double prime plus 3ty1 prime minus y1. We need to do the calculation and we need to get equal to zero. And the answer is yes, I get zero. So therefore y1 is a solution to the differential equation. We need to do the same thing for y2. Start by putting y2 into the differential equation and show that we get equal to zero. And yes, I do. This slide proves that both y1 and y2 solve the differential equation. The third thing we need to do is we need to show that y1 and y2 are linearly independent. So we calculate the Ronskin of y1 and y2. Remember that's the determinant of the two by two matrix, y1, y2, y1 prime, y2 prime. If we put these functions in, we calculate the determinant of this matrix, we get minus three over two, t to the power minus three over two, which importantly is not equal to zero for all positive time t. We didn't need to show that it was non-zero everywhere. We just needed to show that it was non-zero somewhere. But this is, so this is even better because it's non-zero everywhere. 
we know that at least one point is non-zero, so that's enough. This shows that y1 and y2 are linearly independent. And then we finished this question. We've shown that y1 and y2 solve the differential equation, and we've shown that they're linearly independent. Therefore, we've shown that these two functions form a fundamental set of solutions to this differential equation. Our third section for today is about complex roots of the characteristic equation. Let's go back to our general homogeneous second order linear ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients. But now let's suppose that instead of b squared minus 4ac being strictly positive, now let's suppose that this is strictly negative. Then we know that the two roots of the characteristic equation must be complex conjugates. I want to write these two roots as lambda plus i mu and lambda minus i mu, where lambda and mu are real numbers. We could write down two solutions, e to the power r1t and e to the power r1t, r2t. But wait a minute, what does e to the power r complex number mean? We should discuss this. The formula we use from Euler is e to the power lambda plus i mu t is equal to e to the lambda t cos mu t plus i e to the lambda t sine mu t. Lambda is a real number, t is a real number. So e to the power rt is a real number, no problems just there. Mu is a real number and again t is a real number. So cos mu t, again no problems just there. Plus i, okay. e to the power lambda t, again that's e to the power of a real number, that's fine. Sine mu t. Mu t is a real number, we can do sine of mu t. Why is it defined like this? And in particular, what happens if we differentiate e to the power r1t? Let's try it. We want to differentiate e to the lambda t cos mu t plus i e to the lambda t sine mu t. t is our variable, lambda and mu are real numbers, and i is also a number. So we don't need to worry about them when we do our um, differentiation. Using the product rule, derivative of e to the lambda t cos mu t, First, differentiate e to lambda t to get lambda e to lambda t, and then differentiate cos mu t to get minus mu sine mu t. i, we can leave the same. i is just a number, we don't need to worry about i. And then we differentiate e to lambda t sine mu t yeah, mu e to the lambda t sine mu t plus mu e to the lambda t cos mu t. Let's gather together the cos terms and the sine terms. Lambda plus i mu multiplied by e to the lambda t cos mu t 
and multiplied by e to the lambda to the sine root three, I have i lambda minus one. Now, this is minus, this is minus one. But remember, minus one is the same as i squared. You can take a factor of i out just here. Take an i out of the bracket. Instead of i multiplied by lambda, we take the i out. Instead of i squared mu, take one of the i's out and leave the other i inside the bracket. Why am I doing this? Because I have lambda plus i mu and lambda plus i mu in each term. I also have e to the lambda t in each term, which we can factorize out. Sorry, we can leave e to lambda the in, we can factor out lambda plus i mu. But then what's this? This is just exactly the same thing that we started with. What we have is r1 multiplied by e to the power r1t, which, which is what we expect, right? So even though we're doing complex numbers, this rule still applies. e to the power r1t, Take the derivative, we get r1 e to the power r1 t. Okay. So we have these two solutions. But there's a problem here. These are solutions which map from the real numbers to the compact numbers. We put in a real number t, but we end up with a complex number e to the lambda t plus i mu t is probably going to be a complex number, not a real number. And we don't want this. What we want is solutions which map from the real numbers to the real numbers. So we're going to have to do a trick. What we're going to do is we're going to consider instead u and v. Let u be a half y1 plus y2 and let v be 1 over 2i, y1 minus y2. Before I go in, before I fill in the rest of the slide, y1 and y2 are solutions to the differential equation. We know this. So u is a linear combination of y1 and y2. So therefore, u is also a solution to the differential equation. Likewise, v is a linear combination of y1 and y2, so v will also be a solution to the differential equation. If we calculate this, looking at u1 first, we have plus i sine mu t and then minus i sine mu t. These are going to cancel out. We'll end up with a half plus a half is 1 we end up with e to the lambda t cos mu t. For v, cos mu t and then minus cos mu t, these are going to cancel out. We're going to get plus i sine and then minus minus is also plus i sine. We're going to get 2i sine but then divide by 2i, we'll end up with e to the lambda t sine mu t. And these are two real valued functions. Remember, lambda, mu, and t are all real numbers. So now e to the lambda t cos mu t is a real number, and e to the lambda t sine mu t is a real number. We now have two real valued solutions to the differential equation. But are these two solutions linearly independent? To answer this question, we need to calculate the Ronskian of u and v. I want to calculate the determinant of the two by two matrix uv u prime v prime and 
I'll leave this calculation for you to check at a later date. You can check that the run skin is equal to mu e to the power 2 lambda t. Exponential functions are always not e equal to 0. What about the mu? We know that the mu is not 0 because we know that our roots are complex numbers. Because b squared minus 4ac was strictly less than 0, we know that mu is not 0. So therefore, the Ronskin is not 0. So the answer is yes. These two functions are linearly independent. U and V solve the differential equation and they are linearly independent. Therefore, U and V form a fundamental set of solutions to the differential equation. As soon as we know U and V, we can write down that the general solution to the differential equation is a linear combination of u and v. In other words, we can write the general solution to the differential equation as constant e to the power lambda t cos mu t plus constant e to the power lambda t sine mu t. And this is the formula. As soon as we find lambda and mu, we can use this formula to write down the solution to our differential equation. Let's do an example. Solve y double prime plus y prime plus y is equal to zero. We need the characteristic equation. The numbers are one, one, and one, so the characteristic equation must be r squared plus r plus one is equal to zero. And we calculate the roots of this equation. Using the formula, r must be minus 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 minus 4 divided by 2. One minus four is minus three, which we could write as square root of one multiplied by three. But then of course, this is the same as square root of minus one, square root of three, or i multiplied by square root of three. So we end up with minus a half plus or minus i square root of three over two. Why have I written these numbers in orange and green? Because these are lambda and mu. The first number is lambda, lambda is minus half, and the second number is mu. Mu is square root of 3 divided by 2. And that's all we need. Now we're ready to write down the general solution to this differential equation. The general solution is C1 e to the power lambda t, or e to the power minus t over 2, cos mu t, that's cos square root of 3 over 2t, plus a constant c2, e to the power lambda t, e to the power minus t over 2, sine mu t, or in this case sine root 3 over 2t. And that, re that is it. Just on one slide, write down the solution to this differential equation. Another example. Solve y double prime plus 9y is equal to 0. First we need the roots of the characteristic equation. The characteristic equation must be r squared plus 9 is equal to 0 and that tells us that r must be plus or minus 3i. Then we know lambda and mu. Lambda must be 0 and mu must be 3. And that's all we need. As soon as we know lambda and mu, we can write down the general solution to this differential equation. An initial value problem. Solve 16y double prime minus 8y prime 
plus 145 y is equal to zero. We have the initial conditions, y of zero is equal to minus two, y prime of zero is equal to one. We write down the characteristic equation and then we find the roots to the characteristic equation. Here's the calculation. We can find that the roots are one quarter plus or minus three i. Which I leave for you to check at a later date. So therefore lambda must be a quarter and mu must be three. Then we can write down the general solution to the differential equation. C1 e to the lambda t cos mu t plus C2 e to the lambda t sine mu t. To finish this problem, we need to find the constant C1 and C2, which satisfy the initial conditions. We need to differentiate y. Here it is. You can check this. And then we use the initial conditions. We want to have y of 0 is minus 2, y prime of 0 is equal to 1. And again, I'll leave this calculation for you to check. You can check that, therefore, we must have that c1 is minus 2, and c2 must be a half. We can write down that the solution to the initial value problem is minus 2 e to the power of t over 4 cos 3t plus a half e to the power of t over 4 sine 3t. Here is a graph of this solution. Remember we're told that we start at minus 2. And we're also told that the slope here is equal to 1. The solution looks like this. So let me recap what we know so far from today's lesson. To solve a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to 0, First, we write down the characteristic equation and we find the roots of the characteristic equation. Case one, if our roots are different real numbers, then the two solutions that we want, the solutions in our fundamental set of solutions, are e to the power r1t and e to the power r2t. If instead our roots are complex conjugates, lambda plus or minus i mu, then we take the numbers lambda and mu, and our fundamental set of solutions contains e to the lambda t cos mu t and e to the power of lambda t sine mu t. There's one more case which we haven't done yet. I'm going to save that for next week. If the roots are repeated, then something, which we will learn, which we will study next week. Next week, we'll start by doing this. We'll start by looking for repeated roots of the characteristic equation. We'll also study deduction of order, non-homogeneous equations, and the method of undetermined coefficients. Are there any questions?